Get the band back together. Get the symphony. Get the children's choir. Get the high school marching band. And the dancers. Don't forget the dancers. We're gonna play a new song. All of us. Everyone. This will be God's song. It's part of him and it's been given to us. And we will sing it from the tallest buildings be the greatest song of all. We will sing it when we are low. We will sing it when we are on a mountain. It is a song of the universe from its beginning to the present moment. Now, this moment. And it will go on forever because God goes on forever. This is God's song. God the creator. God the good. God the just. God who brushes his opposers off like dust from his shoulders. God the mighty and God the merciful. People will sing this song. People will dance to this song. No critics allowed. They will be stopped dead in their tracks. Their words will be turned against them because today, today we will sing. Today the baby is born. Today the angels break forth. Today darkness cowers in the corner. Today wrongs are righted, prophecies are fulfilled, wounds are healed, the hungry stomachs are filled. Today we all get adopted. Today Jesus comes to earth. Yes, Jesus the Messiah. And this is the song we sing. This song will heal the world. This song is the song of our Savior. He is born. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is born. Merry Christmas week, everybody. It's a good week, isn't it? It's a week of anticipation. It's a week that we've been longing to see. Uh, the time that we all get to exchange gifts, the time that we get to, to be together as families, the time that we get to enjoy one another's presence, all in the name of Jesus. And so this is that week. This is that week of the year that so many people wait for. Lots of kiddos waiting for Christmas Eve, looking forward to Christmas morning. Lots of adults that are longing to see the joy and the excitement in their children's eyes as they get to give good gifts as a reflection of the good gift that God the Father has given to us. And it's such a beautiful time of the year. I think one of the things that's so challenging about this time of the year is that for many, this time of the year also is a hard time. This is the time of the year that we get reminded that there were loved ones that have died this last year. We get reminded of of relationships that are perhaps broken. We get reminded of, of, of lots of things that are very heavy. There's sickness and there's pain and there's those things. And so... Trying to find the joy in the midst of those things can sometimes be a challenge, right? But we know that Jesus has been born. We know that he has come to give hope. He's come to bring joy. He's come to save us from everything. From ourselves, from all the junk, from all everything. And to restore life. And to give us the greatest gift ever. He gave it to us in the form of a little bitty baby. God the Father sent this child named Jesus to this world to live a perfect life, to die on a cross for us, to take our place, to rise again, overcoming death, showing that he's the king over death, meaning when we put our faith in him, we receive life. Death is not the end for us. It's just honestly the beginning of the next. It's the continuation of eternity. And man, what a beautiful reality that is. You know, I'm so grateful for that in my home and in my family this last week. This last week was a challenging week for for us. We went into um, court this last week thinking that we were going to walk away from court with with either our foster children uh, that we were open to adopting, either it being some extended time that they would be in our home, or uh, what would happen is parental rights were likely to be terminated. But what we walked out of this last Tuesday, um, or yeah, Tuesday, what we walked out of the courtroom with was that the one thing that we had pretty well 
um, thought that was not going to be the outcome ended up being the outcome. And, and the children, the judge saw something in the mama that said, it's time to give her another chance. And so the children were reunited with their mama. Which I will tell you guys, that's the goal of all foster care. is for mama to get her, mom and daddy to get their, their lives together so that they can receive their children back home. But I will tell you, it came with a, a, a heaviness in us and a heaviness in many of you guys this last week. As on, at 1 o'clock on Tuesday, we were told by 1 o'clock on Wednesday, they were to be in Corsicana to be reunited. They had to be packed up and ready to go and, 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 that, and, and to be there. So we had a 24-hour turnaround. We threw a going home party in about two hours. Opened up our home for you guys that wanted to come and, and say bye and, and, and wish them well and be excited for the next step in their lives. And um, I tell you, it was hard. Um, Wednesday, I haven't cried as much as I cried on Wednesday. My goodness, I, I'm not sure. I think it was when my dog died whenever I was about seven. <laughs> and it was a heavy day. You know, we seem to be going through, me and my family, we seem to be going through a bit of a heavy time right now. There's just kind of a lot. Nothing different than you guys. You guys are going through heavy times as well. I wonder if we sometimes, when we find ourselves in these heavy times, we resort to questions kind of like, have I done something wrong, God? Have I done something that's outside of what you long for? And perhaps maybe begin to question things like, where do I stand with God? I mean, Jesus has come to bring joy, right? And, and in the midst of the challenges and in the midst of the trials and in the midst of the hard stuff here on this earth, oftentimes I think we find ourselves kind of wondering, and the thought kind of going into our head and thinking, am I doing something wrong? Am I doing something that causes this pain? Am I in right standing with God or maybe am I outside of the zone that God longs for me to be in? Have you, have you been there before? Where you question that? It's a hard place to be, right? Because you know here in your head what Scripture says and the promises of God. But then we know what our experience is here on this earth. And sometimes those things, it's hard to wrap our minds around how all of that plays out and how it works together and kind of where we stand. There may be some of you guys that are in here tonight that are really afraid of where you stand. That really fear where you stand with God. And you find yourself wondering, am I good enough? Am I doing things right enough? Am I, am, I, am I handling myself in a way that pleases God to where he, sh he shines his light on me, where he shines his blessing on me? And then you look at other people and you begin to wonder, God, do I, do I add up to them? Do I measure up to these other people that I see living out this life and living out this faith? Where do I stand in relation to them? And we start to have this kind of, my goodness, God, where do I stand with you? And I promise you, this right here is, is what we call a fear-based life. Where we look and we think, gosh, I'm afraid that perhaps maybe I'm doing something wrong that's causing the pain in my life. I'm doing something wrong that's, that's making the sky fall. And I'm doing the things that I don't need to be doing, but perhaps maybe I'm even doing them ignorantly. And I don't even know. This is the season, though, guys, that time and time again, the angel of the Lord said to people, fear not. I bring you good news. There's joy to be had for all humanity. Guys, this is the season of all seasons that God in his perfect love, his perfect son, his perfect peace entering into us drives out all fear drives out the thing that controls us so much, named fear. What I want to do tonight is I want to pray. Tonight, this is the Sunday of peace. This is the Sunday of Advent. As we anticipate the coming of our Savior, the coming of the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords in the form of this precious baby named Jesus, this is the time that the Prince of Peace 
shows up and we celebrate and we thank him for that. So I wanted to pray peace, the peace of the Lord over us tonight. So can I pray? And then we're going to talk about these guys named shepherds that, man, I think we can relate to at a pretty deep level tonight. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he is the Prince of Peace. And Lord, I pray that everybody sitting in this room right now sense the peace of the Lord. And Lord, as we breathe in, we breathe in deep of your spirit. And Lord, we allow you to cast out and to drive out this controlling mechanism of the enemy called fear. Fear of being alone. Fear of losing a job. Fear of losing a, a friend. Fear of, of death. Fear of tomorrow. Fear of family. Fear of whatever it is. And Lord, I pray that your, your peace fill us up to where there's no room there's no room for anything else. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight, guys, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 again. And we're also going to be in Romans chapter 3. So y'all get, get your device out, whether it's a book or whether it's a, um, a tablet or a phone or whatever, and get there. Luke chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3. I'm going to start reading. Y'all catch up with me, okay? Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Get that in mind, okay? Shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them these famous words, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. That will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, the thing we have to look at here, we think of these shepherds. And we've heard this, we've read this story a lot. When we think of the shepherds, though, I wonder if you've ever wrapped your mind around who these guys were. These were guys that were out in the middle of a field most of their lives. And the thing is, is that as they were there, it's not that they were close to God. It's not that they were close and, and really in religious circles or in, in, in God-fearing circles or anything like that. These were guys that, they, they were out in the middle of nowhere. And so you can imagine when the angel of the Lord showed up and filled the space around them, there was a fear in them that was probably pretty unparalleled because they didn't know what was happening. They had no clue what was going on. And so you have to ask the question that was probably going around in their mind is, why is this good news? Why is this angel coming, terrifying us, and in the same moment telling us, this is good news. There's good news. A Savior has been born. And these guys are probably wondering to themselves, Savior from what? What, what is he saving? What's going on? What is this Savior? What is this person. And so they're asking these questions because these guys were not priests. They were not scribes. They were not, Phar they were not Pharisees. They were not Sadducees. They were not people that would know a lot about these particular events and the prophecies and those kinds of things. I mean, these guys, they were shepherds. They were the lowest ranking people. They had the most embarrassing jobs. They were typically the youngest sons of the family, or perhaps slaves. They were uneducated. They were in a career with no hope for advancement, no future. According to the religious culture, these folks were failures and outcasts. And no matter how hard they tried, they didn't measure up. They didn't measure up. And so therefore, it probably resulted in a constant state of fear in them. Fear of other people, fear of their circumstances, fear of what's going on, which ultimately is a fear of God, right? Resulting in this fear with God. And tonight I wanted just to talk about a few reasons why perhaps maybe they felt a bit distant from God. And we're going to see if we can kind of connect the dots and see, see where we are in that. The first thing is this. One of the reasons that they felt Distant from God is because they felt unworthy. 
And this word is an important word. They felt unworthy because remember, they're outcasts, right? These are guys and that, that, man, they, they weren't good enough for God, according to people. They weren't good enough when it came to the religious activities of the day. They didn't get it done. Because the fact is, is that work consistently made them ceremonially unclean. Over and over and over again, they would miss church, in other words. And this was a big deal at that time. Because they would have to be out in the fields for weeks and weeks at a time. And so therefore they would miss the religious rituals of the day. In fact, the religious people in the area wouldn't even touch them because they were unclean. The people that went to church regularly wouldn't have anything to do with them. And so therefore you can see this unworthiness that they, that they would feel. It's kind of like for us. We know what we do throughout the week, don't we? And then we find ourselves here on a Sunday night and we're, we're worshiping and there's other people worshiping and we begin to compare our lives perhaps with other people's and stuff like that. And isn't it true that oftentimes in the back of our minds we know how we act behind closed doors and therefore there's this overwhelming sense of unworthiness that begins to set in. We know how things are. We know the reality, not what everybody else sees. We know the truth. And that truth can, and it can be an unworthy, it can be an oppressive thing. Because we know what we should do. We know when we don't do it. We know what we shouldn't do. And we know when we do it. We know these things. And over and over and over again, the enemy loves to just heap this unworthiness thing on us. And we have this that comes in and over us. So these shepherds, they felt unworthy. But they also felt inadequate. Because these were uneducated folks. Not only were they uneducated, they were inadequate socially as well. Because remember, they were loners. They were folks that spent so much time out in the fields with these sheep. Their best friends were livestock. And so whenever they would come into town, they smelled bad. And they just, people didn't want to talk to them. And really, they probably didn't want to talk to anybody either. Because it was just so, they were inadequate when it came to social status. They couldn't talk football. They couldn't talk anything with anybody, you know? And so whenever they came to town, they, they felt inadequate. Very quickly, conversations that were taking place by the educated folks be, were over their heads. They couldn't sit there. And so therefore, they found themselves oftentimes probably giving the courtesy laugh, you know? You know the one when people talk about something and they tell you a funny joke or whatever, and you don't get it. You <laughs> You know what I'm saying. They felt inadequate, but not only were they socially inadequate, they were also spiritually inadequate. They couldn't keep the Sabbath. They needed to protect their sheep. So guys, there's some of us that are sitting in this room that feel like we're not as smart as maybe the person sitting next to us. Maybe we don't have the degrees and the pieces of paper on the walls. Maybe we don't have that stuff. And so therefore there's an inadequacy that begins to, to settle in on that. Maybe you're maybe you sit there and you go, yeah, I'm not as popular or attractive. Maybe you don't you're sitting there going, man, I don't have all these Twitter followers and all these Facebook friends and all this kind of stuff. And there's this this sense of inadequacy that can can begin to, to sit in or set in on us. I mean, there's a social inadequacy perhaps that can burden us. Not only that, but there's also a spiritual inadequacy sometimes that can creep in, right? I mean, you haven't been to church in three or four weeks, and then you show up. How is that feel? You know, you haven't been apart, and then all of a sudden you show up, and the stories are being told. You're not sure what was going on because you've been away. And the enemy loves you to say, see, you're not worth anything. You're inadequate. You don't have it together. And, you know, you hear people talking about reading Scripture, and then you haven't read Scripture in like the last year. You haven't opened up your Bible. It's collected dust on the table. All those kinds of things. But all these other people seem to be reading their Bible. All these other people seem to be praying. They seem to be doing these things. And there's a spiritual inadequacy that begins to set in. It can be very oppressive. It can be very rejecting. It can be very hard on us. And so therefore, maybe perhaps you find yourself in, a, in throwing up these desperation prayers, you know? Every now and then when things get bad, you kind of throw the Hail Mary pass up to God and say, I hope you catch it and maybe you'll rescue me again. And if you will, then I won't ever do that again. I promise. Even though you know you will. 
spiritual inadequacy that's there. It, it, it's, and we're not too far away from these shepherds, are we? Oftentimes we can find ourselves in these same things. Well, not only did they feel unworthy and inadequate, they also felt unloved. Because these guys were known as thieves. Because you know somebody that's, that's, that's like these guys, it's kind of like you're driving up to an intersection and you see somebody who doesn't look real great and you lock your doors. That's kind of the way these guys would feel. They were known as thieves. They were, shoot, heck, they weren't even allowed to testify in legal cases because their, their testimony was not seen as credible. Their parents didn't want them to marry a shepherd. And the fact is, is that, man, they just lived a really hard life. Constantly questioning where they are with God. Maybe you find yourself tonight on this Christmas week. The week that we're saying words like, Jesus is here, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And you feel like God is anywhere but right with you. You feel like God is so distant, he's so far away, and man, love seems to be the last thing that you are feeling right now. I mean, maybe you grew up without a dad, and therefore you just, you don't know the Father's love. You don't know. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, an abusive situation that you grew up in. And therefore, the love that, that your father showed you is a direct parallel of how you're feeling towards God. That he's this tyrant that is attacking and creating problems for you again. Maybe your spouse left. You don't like yourself. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know what? If people are rejecting me, flawed people, how in the world can the perfect God love me? If people don't want to be around me, how in the world can perfection want to be around me? And so you feel like God is distant. Well, guys, I want you to understand there's something very important that is the big problem with this whole thing so far and this whole story so far. We're talking about the difference between a religion and a relationship. We're talking about the difference between the fact that the religion did not work for the shepherds. It didn't work for them. The to-do list, the spiritual mumbo-jumbo that had to be you know, these spiritual hula hoops that you had to jump through in order to please God, it didn't work for the shepherds. It doesn't work for us either. And if we're guilty of this religiosity or this religion-based society, then I guarantee you, life is hard. I promise you, it doesn't work. You're going to feel distant from God. Because religion focuses on the externals. Jesus focuses on the internal. Religion focuses on how we act, what we do, if we've got everything together and other people can see that. Jesus says, I don't care what you look like on the outside. All I care about is your heart. I'm not worried about if you say the right things or read the right books or do these things. I'm not worried about these things. I'm worried about your heart. And I long for your heart to be turned towards me. This is God longing to be in relationship with us and is not near as concerned about our actions as we tend to be. It's very important we get this because there's a lot of you that are here today that are feeling unworthy, you're feeling inadequate, you're feeling unloved. You're a single mom and you're sitting there going, I cannot do it all. I'm working myself to the bone and I just can't do it all. I can't seem to get it done. You're a dad and you're sitting here tonight and you're going, man, I don't have enough money in order to give my kids the proper Christmas according to our culture. And you feel like a failure. You're a parent tonight and your kids are going anywhere but the direction you want them to go in. They're not, they're not behaving. They're not obeying. They're, they're not happy, they're, they're angry, they're whatever. And you're sitting here and you're feeling inadequate as a parent. Tonight, you're, maybe you're sitting here, you're not married, and you think, God, nobody wants me. Maybe you're hurting because you're alone. Unworthy, inadequate, and unloved. 
Well, guys, tonight, I want to say to you what the angel of the Lord said to these shepherds. Fear not. Fear not. God is with you. There is a Savior that has been born to bring joy. Not just to you and not just to me, but to everybody on the planet. This really is the season that we get to fear less. And there's good news. Because in Romans chapter 3, here it is, you ready? Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. In other words, no one can ever be made right with God by doing everything right. You can't do enough good to earn the love of God. It's not possible. Number one, you cannot earn God's acceptance by observing the law. And if you're trying to behave properly enough in order for God to plead, to be pleased with you so that he pours his blessing out on you, it's never going to work. It's never going to work that way. The Pharisees, okay, they tried to follow 613 laws. That's a big to-do list. They tried to follow 613 laws. There's no way the shepherds were able to do that. But yet our scripture says that Jesus came for the shepherds. Came in order to save the Pharisees. Came in order to save everybody and to bring joy to all people. Romans 3.20, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. You cannot earn God's acceptance by doing all the right things. Because good behavior doesn't earn you any points. Guys, God is not concerned about behavior modification in your life. He's not concerned about you just acting the right way. What God is longing for is your heart. He's longing to be the foundation of your life and for everything that comes from within you to be consumed by Him. So I promise you, tithing the right amount with the wrong heart is not going to gain you acceptance and blessing. Attending church every single week, but yet your heart is still turned towards yourself rather than God, it's never going to earn you the right relationship with God. Acting the right way, doing the right things, making sure that you don't cuss when you're around the right people, I promise you is not earning any brownie points with God. It's important we understand God is so concerned with the internal much, much more than the external. We have to be understanding of this because the purpose of the law, the purpose of church, the purpose of the Bible, the purpose of all of the things that we know that God longs for us to do or not do even, the purpose of this law is to show your need for a Savior. It's to show that you can't do enough good there's no way. If you've told one little white lie in your life, you are destined to live eternally separated from God. If you've ever told one lie, that's your destiny. To never know God. That's it. It doesn't matter if from here on out, the rest of your life, you're perfect. You will not have eternal life. You will not enter into paradise. You will not... In, you will not cross over into eternity known as a place called heaven or paradise. One mistake, one thing, and you're done. There's no way you can do enough good. There's only one person that's ever walked this earth perfectly. And he was fully human and fully divine. His name is Jesus. There's no way that we can do it. The purpose of the law is to show your need for a Savior. The Pharisees missed this. These 613 laws that were there were there in order to help them understand you can't do enough good to earn God's love. But yet they tried everything they could to earn God's love. And it became more about the laws than it became about God. We are very, very guilty oftentimes today in the 21st century 
of making sure that we do all the right things and those things matter more than our relationship with God. We're guilty of that on a regular basis, but we have to understand the purpose of this law, the purpose of Scripture, the purpose of reading is to help us understand just how badly we need a Savior. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful that we are. If you've ever told a lie, you've ever stolen, you've ever lustfully looked at another person, until you see yourself as a sinner, the bottom line is you won't see the need for a Savior. Until you see the imperfections, until you see the fact that only perfection lives eternally in heaven with God, you'll never see your need for a Savior. And I promise you, until you see yourself as a sinner, you will live in fear. Because that's the tactic of the enemy. You'll be afraid of money forever. You'll be afraid of relationships forever. You'll be afraid of all these things until you see yourself as one who is a sinner. You're never going to know it. You're never going to know your need for a Savior. Guys, I promise you, there's not a person sitting in this room, none of us sitting in this room need more religion. None of us. None of us in this room need more rules to obey, right? None of us need more religion. Every single one of us need Jesus. Every one of us. We need Jesus. And so here it is, guys. Key trick. If you don't get anything else, this is it tonight. You ready? This is it. Righteousness with God comes by faith in Christ alone. If you want to be able to live a life that fears less, it's a righteous life. It's a life that is in right standing. And remember, I'm not talking about how you act. I'm talking about your heart. If your heart is in right standing with God, it is through faith in Jesus Christ alone that this comes. If we don't have that down, it doesn't matter what we do, there's going to be misery. There's going to be oppression. There's going to be unlove. There's going to be inadequacy. There's going to be all of these things because Christianity is not religion. It's a relationship. We have to focus on this because religion is based on what I do, but a relationship is based on what Jesus has done. Religion in this world is about me. If we're religious, it's all about me. It's all about making sure I look good regardless of what's going on inside of my head. It's all about making sure I got the smile and face on regardless of how I'm being torn up inside. It's, it's all about making sure people feel good and when I walk away from them, I'm going to tear them up verbally. It's all about the presentation. But see, this relationship with Jesus is all about Jesus. It's not about acting the right way and saying the right things and doing the right things. It's about focusing on who Jesus is and following Him. It's all about that. Religion is about what we do. Relationship is about what has already been done. It doesn't matter what you do, guys. What matters most is that you understand what's already been done for you. So we get to Romans 3.22. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. This last Tuesday night, I'm sitting in my living room, and I'm talking with somebody. We're talking about the little guys, and, and this, my friend says to me, he says, you know, Danny, this here, and the cancer, and all that stuff that's going on all this stuff that's going on in your home. He said, you know, it makes, it makes you a little more human for all of us. And I know he meant that as a compliment. And I appreciate the compliment. But I will tell you that my humanity can't help but wonder. In my weak moments, my humanity can't help but question my standing with God. And I know you guys have been there too. When we allow ourselves kind of to enter in, we begin to kind of go, okay, God, man, am I, man, where do I stand? Where am I in this? Am I doing something right? Is this it? But I promise you this. 
I'm so grateful that that weak moment, that moment of, is there something that I'm doing that I'm creating a problem here? Is there something that we as a family are not doing that we need to be? I'm so grateful that those thoughts are so fleeting because they come in and then almost instantaneously they're driven out because of this truth. This truth that a right standing with God comes by faith in Christ alone. That it matters more about my heart longing to please God, longing to be all about Jesus Christ, longing to be changed by Him and to receive the gift that He has given. And in that moment, I know it's almost like a, a switch gets flipped because that thought comes into my mind and then that perfect love of Jesus Christ is able to push that fear right out. And it's amazing to me the fullness that comes on the other side. Which is why it is so true that no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what is going on in your life, I promise you, the news that we are celebrating this week brings joy to everyone. We just have to make sure that our hearts are right. We have to make sure that we've opened our hearts to the Savior of the world to allow Him to come in and do only what He can do. We have to give up the reins of our lives and say, okay, God, you do this. I can't heal my wife of cancer. I can't predict the future on whether we're going to adopt children or whether we're not. I can't predict the future on whether my children are going to do a great job and, and honor God with their lives or not. I can't do that. But what I can do is I can have faith in Jesus Christ and I can open up my hands and say, God, you're going to do a whole lot better with this than I am. And so therefore, his burden is easy, his yoke is light. No matter what the circumstances, I can open my hands and go, okay, God, this is all yours. And man, that's the truth, and that's the beauty that drives out fear. So if you want to fear less this Christmas season, if you want Jesus, his perfect peace to drive out, his perfect love to cast out all fear, if you long for that to happen, to receive this joy that we're talking about here, Stop trying to do it on your own. Stop being so concerned about what you do. And be more concerned about whose you are. This morning, I read something. Don't make fun of me. It's by Ann Voskamp. So all you women blog readers and all that kind of stuff. And all you, you know, you guys are like, yay, he's needing something for man. Um, and all you men in here are going, well, give me your man card, sucker. <laughs> It's awesome stuff. She writes really well. I can really dig reading her stuff. So anyway, um, anyway, my sister would call me metrosexual on that one, but that's not even what that is, is it? Anyway, I read this this morning. It said, I don't have to work for the coming of the Lord. I don't have to work for Christmas. The miracle is always that God is gracious. I always get my Christmas miracle. I get God with me. That's really all I have to get ready for Christmas, my heart. So I will come to him just as I am. God gives himself as the greatest gift this Christmas, and he doesn't keep any truly good thing from me, because the greatest things aren't things. Jesus is all good, and he's all mine, and this is always my miracle, my greatest gift. So guys, no matter what, no matter what your reality is, no matter what your circumstances are, Jesus has come so that you can fear less. The good news is that he has come and will bring great joy to all people because a Savior has been born. And I promise you his name is Emmanuel. And if you will open your heart and prepare your heart to receive the Savior of the world, God will be with you. Lord, I thank you for tonight. And I thank you for Christmas. Man, it's such a cool time, Lord. It's so neat to see you do what you do and to be reminded of your story and to look at people like these shepherds and see ourselves in them. To see the weaknesses that they had and see the parallel in us and to know that, Lord, you came and you spoke to them. You chose them. You chose the unpretty people over the pretty people. You chose, you chose the people that, that no one suspected you would choose. And so, therefore, Lord, there is hope for all of us, and we thank you for that. Lord, there's excitement about the future because we know, Lord, that when we trust you exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or imagine is the promise. And so, Lord, let us, 
Let us not be concerned about all of our actions. Let us not be concerned about the words. Let us not be concerned about those things. But Lord, let, let our hearts be filled with you. And out of that filling come the actions. Out of that filling up of our lives come the words. Out of that come the example that you have set for us. And Lord, we thank you for that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys, watch this.